to uh, <coughs> welcome you from the Benton Church. There's a lot of people this uh, month that have been uh, working to make this uh, a blessing for each one of us. Um, for those of you that have never been in the Benton Church, I want to give you a little bit of a sense of who we are. Uh, the Benton Church was started around 20 years ago. It was started by folk that wanted to establish out in an area where there hadn't been an Adventist church. And the people worked together. And that created an atmosphere of the laity working. And since then, this church has pretty much functioned, functioned as a lay-led church. I serve as the lay pastor. Actually, I'm a retired social worker. I don't have a theology degree. Um, but we have uh, a unity of purpose in serving together to witness for the Lord. The um, efforts of today, I just need to say personally, that I really thank Dr. Bauer, uh, Dr. Timcom. Um, I don't think Dr. Lake's here yet, but uh, for these gentlemen to come bring to us what the Lord has shown them through Scripture and to share that and help us to hear and understand better ourselves. I also want to thank uh, David and Victor from the conference. Um, the Benton Church is uh, in a three-church three district. Uh, Dr. Uh, I mean, Pastor uh, David Wendt is our supervising pastor. He's the pastor of the Athens Church. And then we also have another church up down the road, Teleco Plains Church. So uh, we work together in offering um, services of worship and together and we, we come together. So the other thing that I wanted to share with you is, is that today you each should have one of those little schedules with the, the times and what's going to be happening. And by and large, we'll follow that as close as we can time-wise. Uh, there'll be uh, specific announcements made closer to the lunchtime about that so that uh, it'll be more relevant instead of at this point. So if there are any needs, you can sort of see the people that are greeters or who you might want to talk with, or you can feel free to talk with myself or Victor Maddox, and um, if there are any needs that you might have. Um, I just pray that each of you will be blessed by your participation today here, and that the Holy Spirit will bless us through what is said, what is studied, what is learned. Victor, would you have any want to come on up and just kind of focus with some other aspects. Victor, uh, for those of you that have not known Victor, but Victor is the director of pastoral ministries uh, for the G Georgia Cumberland Conference. And he and his staff have um, really uh, afforded great help in preparing this material today, bringing, bringing forth Dr. Bauer and Dr. Lake and Dr. Tinkham. So, Victor, thank you Great. very much. It's good to be here. And how's everyone uh, doing on this brisk Sabbath morning? Yes. It was cold out there. But uh, God is good. The sun is shining. And it is our prayer that the uh, love and the light of Jesus will continue to shine in each one of our hearts as we come together and uh, talk about a very important topic. As a number of you know, uh, the, the whole discussion on the Trinity has been something that has taken place since the uh, early uh, beginnings of the, 
the Christian church. Uh, even then, the early church fathers wrestled with this, and they came up with what they uh, believed, uh, based upon scripture, to be a good, solid um, Trinity doctrine. And of course, we know that over the years, that doctrine has been altered and used for various purposes by different denominational beliefs. Uh, as our pioneers uh, began to discuss this topic, there was a lot of discussion, uh, an attempt to understand more deeply uh, who and, and who the Trinity is and if it is a viable doctrine to maintain. And um, they, they struggled. And even as we look at the history of our church, we see that there has always continued to be some discussion on it. And you know, if there was no discussion on this topic of the Trinity, personally speaking, I would be concerned. Because when we talk about the Trinity, when we talk about the Godhead, we're talking about a subject that we can categorize as being totally, I mean, it is beyond us. To be able to comprehend God in his fullness, his wholeness, and to be able to explain that, to put a title on it, and to be able to walk away and say, we know everything about God, so uh, let's move on to something else. That is just a thought. That is a belief that is, it, it's not something that's feasible that we can support. But yet, God in his infinite wisdom, God in his desire to be known, God in his desire to become a personal God, he has given us some insights into ways to understand him and how the Godhead does function. And so I say that to you uh, as we begin this symposium, uh, we will not come out of this place with a definitive answer to this. But yet at the same time, we will walk away from this symposium, I believe with a working understanding that will serve to deepen our relationship with a God who wants to be known. And the great thing about it, I was sharing this with, uh, with uh, Pastor Joe Cooper earlier, um, the wonderful thing about the, this tr uh, Trinitarian doctrine, and the wonderful thing about God and his desire to be known, along with that comes the invitation to spend eternity knowing God and coming to know him better and learning of his character. And I think that's a wonderful thing. So with that all said and done, we welcome you to this uh, Trinity Symposium. Um, I want to encourage you that because of time, the presenters are going to deal specifically with the topic. If you have any questions, there should be some question cards in the pews in front of you. Just write down your questions. If you look at the program, you'll see that there will be a time where we can entertain some questions from the cards, just to kind of maintain law, you know, some, some, some order here, because you know, there's a lot of people here who've been studying this thing for a long time. Uh, also, during our breaks, if you feel inclined to approach any of the speakers, feel free to do so as time allows. So right now, okay, right now we're going to uh, have a song. And then we're going to have a prayer uh, by Pastor Went. And then the next thing that we will hear will be a presentation uh, from our first uh, presenter, Dr. Stephen Bauer, who serves as a, a professor of theology and ethics at Southern Adventist University. Um, I've known Dr. Bauer for quite a number of years. I didn't sit under him as a student, you know, and that probably saved him a little headache. But Dr. Bauer, <laughs> yeah, I was down in Florida, but Dr. Bauer has uh, been serving this community for many years. Uh, he was uh, also served as a pastor, so he understands some of the challenges on the church level as well as he uh, prepares students uh, to enter into the, the gospel ministry. So with that said and done, I'm going to invite us all to stand as we sing together. Number 200 and what? 23. 223. <laughs>
If you will join me kneeling as we come before the Lord in prayer. Good morning, our kind Father in heaven. Lord, it is with great joy that we come before you this morning, thanking you, Lord, for this chance to come together as a church and worship you. Father, we pray for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. First, to be with your manservant, Dr. Bauer, as he brings us the message. But also, Lord, that you would open up our ears and teach us what you want us to hear. Yes. We thank you. Bless us to this end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. It's a pleasure to be here on this semi-cool, I got to tease Victor a little bit here, uh, semi-cool Sabbath morning. I tell my Southern students, what are you going to do when it actually gets cold out? Um, yet to see, I'm originally from New England, and uh, this December will be my 39th anniversary, which I'm trying to figure out since I'm only 29. And... Um, um, being poor young couple, we honeymooned in New Hampshire at Christmas to get the off-season rates, and it was record cold, and Christmas morning was 35 below zero. So this isn't that bad. <laughs> we thank you all for being here, and uh, those of you who have come from other churches, uh, sacrificing your own church services to unite on this important project, and uh, we thank you for uh, being here, I see a few I recognize from various points uh, in my past, and many that I recognize less from my past, so we'll have to get acquainted during breaks uh, and lunch. 
Before I start my formal presentation, uh -huh, I was going to say, I don't see any clock in the back, but I see it's way up under the fan. And I say, I can have a timeless presentation. Um, the Trinity is not an easy topic. And to a great degree, when we're talking about God, none of us knows what we're talking about. <laughs> On the other hand, God has revealed certain things about himself that we can be certain of. And it's ironic that people like to use the, um, the parable or story, call it what you will, of the four or five blind men all groping an elephant. You've heard this one. And the one guy's got the tail and he, he says the elephant is like a rope and another guy's got a leg and elephant is like a tree. And people use this to try to argue, see, no, there is no objective truth. I'm like, no, that part of the elephant was like a tree. <laughs> and so I can be certain, but I may not be certain what the whole elephant is. Okay. And I can be certain this piece that I'm experiencing is like a rope, you know. And so God has revealed himself in ways that we have things we can be certain about, but in that certainty we know it's only a piece of the elephant. And so um, knowing that it's only a piece of the elephant doesn't mean we can't have a certain amount of certainty, but we need to know the limits of our certainty. And that's what I want to probe today. A second introductory comment. Uh, this first presentation in particular is not going to be easy. I'm trying to, but it's going to have some techno speak and so forth that we'll have to work our way through because we're dealing with church history. And when we deal with church history, there are technicalities involved that we just can't avoid so we understand the context in which we're living. Now, I'm dealing with early church history and kind of the development of the Trinity doctrine and how I believe it differs from Adventism. And so I'll leave those definitions in a moment, but I just feel moved to uh, add something maybe a bit, a bit blunt at the beginning, but I think it's important to say. When I was a younger pastor, notice the er ending, um, mostly in the New York City area, we had a group who would go around and show up often at the smaller churches, rarely at the big churches. And you all have probably heard of them, the Shepherd's Rod. Okay? And I had a 22-member company in Brooklyn that was struggling over Desmond Ford issues and the shepherd's rod is showing up. So what do we do? I talked to my ministerial director and a couple of experienced pastors and, and I found their counsel to be sound. First of all, in Romans 16, verse 17, Paul says something rather strange. As he's closing out this book and he's in the middle of a bunch of personal greetings, I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for, or in the King James, mark them. The Greek is the idea of scoping out. Scope out those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. The most important tool I had with my small churches, if I'm not there and the shepherd's rod shows up, tell them we're not here to engage in that issue. We're here to worship the Lord. Because these kind of groups like the shepherd's rod are parasitic on, they depend on their existence for the mainline church. 
they can't exist independently. And they come around to church to church, and because we're not spiritually mature, they make inroads easily because we engage them not knowing what we're doing. In Ephesians in the spiritual gifts chapter, is that four or five? I think it's four. Paul says that God gave the spiritual gifts that, quote, we might no longer be children tossed about to and fro by every wind of doctrine. So if a child is someone who is tossed and to and fro by the latest theological fads that walk through the door of the church, what would the spiritual adult be? It would seem like they would be somebody not easily tossed, stable. So if somebody came into the church and said, well, you know, we think the Sabbath has been changed, you might give them enough polite ear for 10 minutes or something, and you're going to say, look, we've already studied this. <laughs> I don't think we're going to get anywhere in this discussion, and you'd move on. And just like we do that, you know, we have a fundamental belief that we've studied hard and long, and if you're going to be intellectually honest, this is where the Seventh-day Adventist Church is at. And we don't have to engage in extended conversations that encourage them to keep coming back and distracting us from the mission we have. And frankly, folks, we don't need these distractions because the social currents right now, particularly over personal identities related to sexual behaviors and preferences, We've just had a presidential candidate who's now dropped out of one side of the race, who was advocating that religious organizations who do not jump on that bandwagon should lose their tax-exempt status. Freedom of religion is more and more hanging in the balance over these issues. And we got far more important fish to be frying than arguing with a few people with a bee in their bonnet that we've already settled. Amen. And so the other thing we did was we got our elders and pastors in touch. So if the shepherd's rod showed up here, hey, these are the folks. If they show up, you know who they are. You're ready to put the limits of why we're here and so forth. Um, and I would encourage our East Tennessee churches, um, band together, know your elders and uh, pastors back and forth so that you can be communicating um, these things. But the less we engage in the distractions, the less likely they are to keep coming to distract us. And I learned that also in a, a church I call World War III in Armageddon in one package. And it wasn't over this issue, it was over doctrine of atonement. Uh, but when I came in to be the pastor of that church, I thought I had found the beast of Daniel with the iron teeth that crushes everything in pieces. And when we got about our father's work and didn't engage in the distractions, the people who wanted to fight and argue started to leave. And people who wanted to work started to come. And in a year and a half, we had a completely different church on fire for the Lord. And so... Um, take Romans 16, 17. If you're here to argue, we have more important things to do, and we're going to avoid the argument and not engage this and just move on uh, in the Lord. And then you can do a lot to help yourself out. So with that, I just put myself behind schedule, and, uh, but I felt moved by the Lord to speak from that experience. Now, I'm on a strange clicker, so let's see which way this thing goes. Helps if you turn the switch on. Voila. I'm going to go very rapidly through this part. Um, a few resources, publications, uh, etc. From the Adventist side, at your ABC, we have this book on the Trinity, which has a basic overview of our history and some of those arguments and so forth. It's written to be layman friendly. Um, I know all three editors. And... Uh, uh, so this is, 
It doesn't hit every technicality, but it'll give you a good foundation. Uh, our own Norman Gully, a research professor retired, I took his budget 20 and a half years ago, I replaced his budget at Southern when he retired. <coughs> He's got a whole volume of systematic theology about that thick that you can get at the local ABC if you really want to get into the technicalities. Um, General Conference, the Biblical Research Institute, BRI for short. Um, you can just go to Google and put Adventist Biblical Research Institute and it should pop up their website right away and uh, go from there. They've got a bunch of Trinity stuff in their resources that you can look at online. Adventist Theological Society has a layman's oriented um, where we take our scholarly work and kind of readers digest it for the average person. I was president for two years and so I had to submit eight presidential columns and I believe five of them were engaging anti-Trinity issues. And so if you go to perspectivedigest.org and I see something wrapped in my fonts here, but Perspective Digest, all one word, dot O-R-G, and find there's two search engines in there. One is like by author and stuff. So figure out if you type my last name, you can find those articles. If you type in Trinity, you can find there's a whole bunch of stuff in there as well. Um, and so uh, Adventist Theological Society has some resources for you um, this way. So I just said Trinity. These are older screenshots. I believe the search engine is now at the bottom of the page. I went to use it about nine months ago and couldn't find it. We had just switched vendors. So I emailed our editor, hey, where's the search engine? And oh, that's a good question. So I believe it's fixed uh, and working again. You also have uh, this, what I'm doing today in four parts, I did in about two and a half hours at Adventist Theological Society, local here in Collegedale. That was recorded by Audioverse. If you go to audioverse.org, you've got the marathon session of what we're breaking up into four parts today. And, uh, and I believe they have PDFs of the PowerPoints that I used that day, which would be similar to ours. Uh, some non-SDA, um, Millard Erickson's one volume, Christian Theology, has a section on the Godhead that does a nice job of covering some of the history and stuff in a relatively not too technical uh, way. So we want to move to history. For many years, um, we haven't had a lot of controversy over the Godhead in Adventism. But it seems to me that since the late 1990s, early 2000s, it's been exploding and increasing. In fact, in the late 90s, and actually in the early 2000s, I spent so much time in Gulf States Conference going to churches on this issue that the then ministerial secretary, Don Shelton, who I believe pastored up toward Lenoir for a while when he retired, um, Don was jokingly calling me the associate ministerial secretary of the conference. I was down there so much for a while. Um, so it's been on the rise, and the tendency is to appeal to Adventist pioneers, James White, Uriah Smith, Joseph Bates, etc., um, this way. And so I want to lay a definition right now that in my humble opinion, the anti-Trinity debate in Adventism right now is not so much an argument over scripture, it's an argument over the church fathers of Adventism. Just like the Catholics are arguing over their church fathers, <clears throat> we're arguing over our church fathers. But the last I checked as a Seventh-day Adventist, my faith is not based in the church fathers, it's based on the scriptures. And so uh, the church fathers need to be tested by scripture. Okay. Now, Dr. Lake is going to um, have a whole session dealing with Adventist history and Ellen White issues, so I'm not going to delve into that uh, much right now. 
But what I am suggesting is, as a theologian looking at the big picture, we have moved in, what, 160 or 70 years to the place that it took the early church about 300 years to get to. So we're going at about double speed. <clears throat> and we're repeating some of those early patterns and I think we could learn some lessons from them if we understand what's going on here. As somebody once quipped, uh, the internet ascribes various authors, so I don't know who the real author is, but we like to joke that the one thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. <laughs> And as Dr. Pauline, my New Testament professor at seminary, quipped once, it is very common that what erupts as new truth is merely an old heresy we forgot about from 500 years ago, you know, or a thousand years ago. Uh, and I think there's great truth to that uh, this way. Now, I want to introduce a nuance. We're at the bottom of the slide. Uh, I was expecting slightly larger screens, but hopefully that's big enough for you to be able to more or less read um, this way. I want a nuance between what I would call the creedal trinity and the biblical trinity. Biblical trinity is quite minimalist in its content. Creedal Trinity has a lot of philosophical extras. And I would propose, and Dr. Lake will pick this up later, but in my own reading, and even more so talking with the experts in Adventist history, you know, Jerry Moons and Judd Lakes and Merlin Burtz and Woody Woodens and these kinds of people, um, uh, Tim Poyer at the White Estate, etc. Um, I am convinced that when James White and Bates and so forth were picking on the Trinity that they were using the word in an extremely precise manner and they were using it of the creedal definition from the Council of Chalcedon in 451 which is the mainline Trinity okay the way we use the word Trinity today is much more loosey-goosey than they were using it. And so what's happening is our anti-Trinitarians are taking advantage of this difference in terminology and definition and precision to leverage argument. I also want to take a quick time out. I forgot to say one other thing. I'd like to nuance between what I would call anti-Trinitarians and non-Trinitarian Adventists. Okay? The reality is, in my experience, they basically believe the same thing. Okay? The difference is, is that the non-Trinitarian is very happy to sit in the pew and not make a fuss about it. Whereas the anti-Trinitarians are the one agitating and causing trouble. So if I'm a pastor, and I have a non-Trinitarian who believes differently, but they're not causing agitation. You want to come worship with me? Fine, you know. Maybe someday the Holy Spirit will touch your heart through my preaching, you know. But when you're causing disturbance and trouble, that's where the issue is, okay? Uh, you know, that's where the issue is. So technically, they believe the same thing, um, relatively speaking. I do find there are a few nuances here and there, but there's a core of commonality, and I'm addressing more that core of commonality uh, today. So, I would suggest um, that our fundamental belief statement on the Trinity is agreeable to the creedal Trinity, but it's incomplete for their viewpoint. Um, they're gonna say you didn't say enough. You left too many doors open. And in fact, they might even accuse us of being tritheists. Um, <clears throat> now, doctrine of Trinity is not explicitly defined in the Bible. Uh, we used to have one text in the King James Bible. <clears throat> uh, 
that we can tell from textual criticism was altered around the 10th to 11th century AD. Uh, you can see the two versions here, the King James, for there are three that bear record in heaven, Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. What a slam dunk text. But before the 10th century, we don't find it in this form ever. <laughs> so it's clear that some scribe decided to help the Bible out a little bit and uh, tweak that one. So you have a more modern translation underneath. There are these three that testify, the spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree. And this seems to be the more evidential. So the one proof text some people thought they had didn't exist before the 10th century AD. What I would say is that we observe the Trinity <clears throat> in the Bible. The way we observe other things and by taking these observations, we construct this doctrine, not unlike how we construct other doctrines. Or positions. For example, the doctrine of healthful living. <clears throat> there is no text in the Bible that says live healthily. But we construct theological concepts that the implications of stewardship of yourself, you know, these kinds of things say health matters, holistic view of man, right? And we construct a theology out of this. Anti-slavery. You go back a hundred years or a little over a hundred years, 150 years, and you had people making biblical quote-unquote arguments for slavery, right? And the proof text method was pretty handy for pro-slavery. It was through constructing theological principles that we observed in scripture that we came to the anti-slavery position. Ditto with anti-polygamy. <clears throat> there is no text in the Bible that says thou shalt not have more than one spouse. And Abraham had multiple wives. He's the man of God, David, you know, Solomon, so forth and so on. <coughs> there was a pro-polygamist who got a hold of Mark Twain, browbeat him for quite a while on the advantages of polygamy. He said, I'll bet you can't cite one text of scripture expressly forbidding the practice. And Twain being Twain quipped, nothing easier. No man can serve two masters. <coughs> <coughs> well, Twain's sentiment was good. <coughs> we probably could stand a little better exegesis than that, right? Our three phases. You get the point. There are doctrines that aren't just bluntly in one text here or there. But by assembling evidence, we come to a solid theological conclusion. And I would argue that the Trinity doctrine or three-person Godhead doctrine works the same way. Now we get to the history. The earliest church was comprised of mainly Messianic Jews for the first number of years. And Messianic Jews would have been staunchly monotheistic, right? One God, one person. Hear, O God, Deuteronomy, you know, the Shama here of Deuteronomy 6, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is. And you shall love the Lord your God, etc., with all your heart, soul, and mind. So how did these monotheists suddenly come to some kind of multi-person God? <coughs> there are three factors that are involved with this that also involve... Um, as we bring the Gentiles into the faith, you know, that adds to the mix as well. First of all, claiming the deity of Christ. You have a Jew named John who wrote a gospel named after him. In the beginning was, and the word was with God, two different being, right? with God, but then the word, whoa, John, how did you just say that? I thought you were a monotheistic Jew. And yet he's calling God, God, and the word God. And yet they can be with each other. 
and he offers absolutely no explanation. He just drops it out as a bombshell of inspired faith. And how these Jews dealt with divinity of Christ and divinity of the Father, not recorded in the Bible. A second factor, especially again to the early church, both the Jewish, is persecution. Trinity is a type of theology that we would call philosophical theology. And when people are running for their lives and being cut off economically and burnt at the stake and, you know, it's dangerous to be a Christian, right? It's a good way to get yourself killed in a painful manner. Those folks tend not to worry about philosophical theology. It's a much more pragmatic, Jesus, I need you to help me right now. Okay? And so, the persecution of the early church would tend to suppress those kind of questions about how are we monotheist if Christ is God and the Father is God? You're too busy surviving, right? And the third factor is, as the Gentiles come into the church and as the apostles die off, starting in the second century, which means the 100s, right, because the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 50, 30, 60, 80s, those are the first centuries, right? And 100 is the last year of the first century. 101 is the first year of the second century. So the second century, we start to see 25 years into that century, church bishops starting to bring Platonic thinking into Christianity. Greek philosophy, especially Plato. They were Neoplatonists. And this continues to build until the time you get to Augustine in 400, very heavy Platonic, kind of a mixture, a syncretism of Plato in the Bible uh, this way. And it's going to be this Platonic influence that will play a key role in the creedal trinity that our pioneers were objecting to this philosophical influence, not to the biblical portion. And particularly the major leaders, the bishops in charge of areas, kind of the equivalent of our conference presidents or union presidents were the ones who were publishing because publishing was limited and uh, so it goes. Now, it comes to a head in the early fourth century, late, yeah, late, early fourth century, right in the early 300s. Um, we have a guy named Arius who starts to argue that Jesus was more semi-deity. He was the first thing that God created and then God created everything else through Christ. And so Christ is kind of a second tier God created by the first God. But because he's created, he's not really deity, so we're not polytheists. So this raises the question, if Jesus is deity and the Father is deity, How do we say we have one God? Now we're implicitly starting to ask that question. Second thing that happens is in the early 300s, Constantine has his conversion to Christianity. And suddenly Christianity is now a legal religion. And if the emperor is a Christian, he's not going to order persecution. Now the persecution has been waning. The latter part of the 200s was kind of a stalemate. You know, these Christians are here, we're not getting rid of them, so let's just kind of ignore them. You know, there wasn't a lot of persecution in that last 25 to 50 years, which is opening the way for the early 300s now for Constantine to have his vision that he claims to have had baptizes his army, wins this battle, and now I'm a Christian. And um, 
But the point is, that removed the persecutory pressure that tends to suppress the philosophical questions. But in order to combat Arius, Arius's argument was partly reliant on Plato. So the church fathers decided to fight Plato with Plato. And so a portion of the Trinity doctrine comes, the creedal Trinity doctrine, comes more out of this Platonic root. And that's where our pioneers struggled. Okay? And rightly so, by the way. Okay, rightly so, this way. Uh, just a quick parallel. When Adventism erupts out of the great Millerite movement, the great expectation on October 22nd, the great disappointment on October 23, right? They weren't disappointed on the 22nd, <laughs> right? <laughs> People say October 22 is the great disappointment. No, October 23 is the great disappointment. Um, <clears throat> And as we were coming out of the turmoil of the great disappointment, there was much public opposition to Millerism and the Advent movement coming out of it. We were being publicly attacked in newspapers and stuff, right? And of course, they wouldn't publish our rebuttals, so we had to publish our own papers. And present truth and signs of the time in review were often writing rebuttals to these other publications. So the point is, we were under a mild persecutory environment. And Jesus is coming very soon. The mark of the beast is happening next month. We don't have time to worry about questions like this. And it's really not until um, the late 1800s that we start to have, an, people realize this group ain't going away, um, that we start to have more debate into the 30s uh, and after Ellen White's death that the peaceful environment allows us to explore these questions more this way. So with that in mind, Arius argument was based on the concept of usia. And the dot doesn't show up on the screen. Substance. And in the Platonic mind, your substance, which could be spiritual or physical substance, that's the seed of reality that makes you what you are. So if you're made of human substance, you're going to act, think, and immune like a human. If you're comprised of rabbit substance, you're going to you're going to be wired like a... So it's kind of the hard wiring theory. And he argues that the son and father are similar but differing substances. Notice the Bible says nothing about this. <laughs> so the goal of the bishops was to prove that Jesus is of the same substance, same usia, as the Father, the technical term homo usia. Whereas Arius said they're not the same but similar. Homo usia, one extra letter uh, this way. So they, instead of just taking biblical revelation, they take this Greek need to prove they're of the same substance there's a divine substance, so if Jesus is divine, he must have to be of that divine substance that the Father is. He can't be something different and still be divine. So how do we get there? Well, there were three major church councils plus some minor ones over around 126 years where they debate this back and forth until they finally get to the final formulation. So we're walking through our philosophy here. A little bit. So, how did they come to the conclusion that there was one usia? The Latin fathers, what do we mean by the Latin fathers? The earliest church fathers wrote their manuscripts in the same style of Greek as the Bible. It's called Koine Greek. 
So these are the Greek fathers. But as we get up toward Augustine, increasingly the newer generations of church fathers wrote in Latin, not in Greek. And so these are known as the Latin fathers because of the um, language that they were writing in has changed to the language of imperial Rome. And the Latin fathers take the father-son language of the Bible and they extrapolate it and reverse engineer it back into eternity. And they argue then that as a human son begotten from his father is of the same substance as his father, that there must be some kind of begetting between God the Father to God the Son so that the begotten Son would be of the same substance as the Father. Now, quick time out that's not on the slide. This begetting is not dealing with your DNA and the human begetting. It's dealing with the soul. It's related to the immortal soul. And I have to be delicate here, though I don't see many children. Um, we'll just say in the human procreative act from the male perspective, um, there is a substance sent forth. And that substance was viewed by these people as a piece of the father's immortal soul breaking off to be put into the womb of the mother where it would somehow acquire a body and grow so you only get your soul from your father. You do not get soul from your mother. She just adds, you know, blue eyes and red hair and person, you know, this kind of stuff. But your basic soul, and this is not Adventist theology at all, right? You know, immortal soul. And so this is the original sin doctrine. When Adam procreates Cain and Abel and Seth and so forth, they all become a piece of his soul like an amoeba breaking apart, you know. And then that soul of Adam that broke off into Cain or Abel, or well, probably not Abel, I think he was murdered without children, but Seth, right? So when Seth now procreates, he's breaking off more pieces of this soul into his children, and so we're all pieces of the soul that sinned in Eden. Now, biologically, we know that ain't true. <laughs> We now know mom contributes something, but they didn't know that. So this idea then that a piece of the actual substance somehow divides to make a human begotten son gets now engineered back that God somehow spews out a son substance in a similar, not in a sexual fashion, but in this somehow coming out of his being a break off or an emission from his being. And they call this begetting. But now we got a problem. Because by biblical theology, God, if you're God, you have no beginning. But if you're begotten, you have a beginning. So how can Jesus be God if he's begotten? Back in eternity. Notice this is all philosophy and logic, nothing to do with exegesis and scripture. So, third bullet of the three subs, their solution was to argue that the Father is eternally and always begetting and generating the Son. Even today, God is begetting the Son. It's a constant process of begetting an emanation that never had a beginning, so that the Son is always and forever eternally being begotten and coexisting with God. Then, the later stages of this process argue then that the Holy Spirit was eternally proceeding from the joint being of the Father and the Son. 
And so the Holy Spirit's not said to be begotten, but he is still somehow generated and eternally proceeding out of the jointness of these two. This means this is how the Holy Spirit has no beginning. And so we were partly settled at the Constantinople Council in 381, and then the final articulation that runs Catholicism and mainline uh, Christianity today is Chalcedon in 451. So Arius, I don't know if I had that date up there, the Council of Nicaea in 325 is kind of the official start. So you go 325 to 451, it's roughly 126 years. And it's this Constantinople that is the creed of your you know, Episcopal, Catholic, etc. kind of churches. Southern Baptists may be a little looser on this, okay. But your creedal type churches, the one who like to recite the creed every Sunday, this is where they're going to stand on the Trinity is with Chalcedon. This is the Orthodox Creed, okay? And the formula in simple terms is that the Godhead, these three beings, because of the begetting and proceeding, they are a single substance. They are one usia, but three persons. So one substance, three persons. Not one person in three modes. This is the heresy of modalism, where there's only one person who expresses himself as father, also expresses himself as son, also expresses himself as Holy Spirit, but these are three modes of expression of one person. We call that modalism. And that was dealt with during this 126 years and they said, this doesn't make sense philosophically or biblically. So one substance, three persons. Now our experts, <clears throat> and again, Dr. Lake can address this, and I think Pastor Tinkham can address this because he's a little bit more fresher at their feet than I am. Um, but it appears to us that our early pioneers tended to confuse one substance as being one person, and they understood the creedal trinity more modalistically. And thus, if there's really one person, and God and the Father are just manifestations, and Jesus is not an independent person, you depersonalize Christ. And they did not want Jesus depersonalized. Okay. So I think part of their objection to the creedal trinity is not just the philosophy, but that they didn't understand it correctly, so they unwittingly are attacking a straw man. So all of this, again, is to try to prove that Christ is of the same substance, usia, as the Father. And if he is the same substance, then he's equally divine, etc. But to do it, we have to invent the eternal begetting doctrine, which has nowhere in the scriptures. It's a logical construct of the Greek philosophy. Got to keep rolling here. So I know this is heavy stuff, and I'm trying not to go too fast. All righty, somewhere in here. I make the habit at the classroom of turning off the power to my machine, and I'm not used to this one. And so I keep forgetting where my switch is. Now, after or mid-process of this creedal development, we have the introduction of Jerome's Vulgate version of the Latin Bible. Now, there's a previous version of the Latin Bible, the top here, the early or old Latin. And in the New Testament, we got like six to eight uses of the word monogenes. And the Old Latin, every single time monogenes is used, they translated it with unicus, which is the root of our word unique. And that's exactly what it means, unique. Nothing else like it. 
Now after, it, look at the date, Constantinople happens in 381, and Jerome's Vulgate is commissioned in 382. It took him like, what, 20 years or so to finish it out? Uh, it was near 400, as I recall, when he finally published the, the full volume. But it's interesting, he's commissioned after some of these definitions have been made and looky, 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 what happens to Monogenes in the Vulgate. And let's go to the next slide. First of all, Jerome, there were enough manuscripts out there that we were starting to get variations of what does the Bible say. So Jerome kind of introduces us to textual criticism and he sifts through and figures out what the most reliable documents were and so forth and so on and cleans it up a bit. But I suspect Constantinople plays a role because when you have Monogenes not used of Christ, for example, um, Jairus' only daughter is a Monogenes, only child, only daughter, his Monogenes daughter. They translate that with Eunuchus still. Or in Hebrews, Isaac is Abraham's monogenes, i.e. unique son. They still leave, he still leaves Eunuchus there. But suddenly, whenever monogenes is used of Jesus, he changes the Latin to unigenitus, which is the equivalent of the Greek monogenao, not monogenes, literally only begotten. So this is the first time we have a biblical translation that calls Christ only begotten, and it's from a project commissioned after the eternal begetting is starting to develop. Put two and two together, right? You know, you put two and two together. And this is then what goes into the Textus Receptus, which is the basis of the King James. And Ellen White, of course, being a good King, good King James student, just uses the language of only begotten, but I would contend that when you look at how she uses the language, she uses it in the biblical way of expressing uniqueness, not a description of origins. So, all of this, the Creedal Trinity goes well beyond the Bible. Taking the philosophical concept of usia, with its role in determining being, in the Bible, it's more God's spirit and the so-called spirit of the man, which we get uncomfortable with as Adventists, but there is this idea of some kind of spiritual nature that is the seat of your inner being, it's not a separate soul, you know, but God moves on the spirit of the judges, for example, and we uh, get a little uncomfortable with that. And so in the Bible, spirit is the moving force. In Greek philosophy, usia becomes the moving force. And then again, to summarize, that led to the eternal beginning and eternal proceeding because they're modeling it on the begetting relationship of human father and human son and extrapolating that back into eternity. I would contend that in the Bible we do find three personal beings depicted with the same attributes and eternal divine functions, but no explanation is given. It's just there. And so we simply say we observe God as three persons and yet there's only one God. And the Bible offers no explanatory mechanism. I just got to accept this and live with the tension. And that's the tough part of it. All righty. I'm on. And uh, here we go. So the creedal view is doing a reverse engineering that by looking at man, 
we can know something about God. And it's kind of the idea that if, it's almost like the sanctuary typology. If we look at the type that Moses made since it was a copy of the heaven, right? So if man is the image of God, if we look at the image, I think with the role of sin and damaging the image of God, we need to look at who God is in order to figure out what our image is. <laughs> Instead of going the other way around, okay, uh, this way. And to me, this is the big problem both of creedal Christianity and of our current anti-Trinitarian movement is that it's too dependent on going from human construct and engineering it back into God. Now, next major bullet, center major bullet. The creedal view has tended to be run through Christianity focusing on the oneness of the Trinity. Catholicism, Orthodoxy, Anglican Episcopal, we believe in three persons and one substance, one God, but it's the unity, the oneness of the Trinity. Whereas in Adventism, because of our focus on the sanctuary and the mediatorial interaction between Christ and the Father, we tend to focus on the threeness in order to pick up the interdynamics. So this oneness focus focuses on who they are in their essential nature. that all have the same powers, the same eternity, the same, you know, capacities, etc. Essential nature. We call this view of the Trinity the imminent Trinity. And notice it's with an A. Um, it's not imminent with an I close at hand, but immanent is a term dealing with essential nature and what it is essentially in itself. Whereas I would contend that in the Bible, we don't see God depicted so much in the imminent way. We see God depicted in the roles that each member has taken to relate to creation and mankind. And particularly in light of the plan of salvation. Okay. And so these relationships of who's going to do what. We have this job to do, let's divvy it up. You do this part of the job, I do that part of the job, you do that part of the job. Those are economic relationships. And so we have a view of the economic trinity views God through the various functions that the Father seems to have specialized in, the Son seems to have specialized in, and the Spirit seems to specialize in, and yet we would agree that any one could do any of those functions. Okay? And so the sanctuary doctrine for Adventism, because of 1844 and the intercession of Christ, Christ is the mediator between God and man, not the Father, Father could play that role, but Christ has been assigned that role for some reason. <clears throat> so we focus more heavily on the economics of who's interacting with whom. And one of the problems I think we have then is that people read these economic descriptions in Ellen White in the Bible, and they confuse them with being essential nature, with imminent. And if we understand the difference, it makes a difference. We should be near, nearing the end, and my time is nearing the end as well. I just said number one, and I'm going to read an Ellen White quote on the next slide. I would like to suggest that it appears to me, based on the roles that they have actually revealed themselves in, that the Trinity has self-organized to take on specialized roles and there's an important reason. The Father 
seems to showcase the high, mighty, awe-inspiring, fear-inducing aspects of God. You see God on the throne, and like Isaiah in Isaiah 6, you're like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh. The Father is the shock and awe specialist. Somebody who holds up the office and the highness of it. And yet we know from Scripture the Father himself loves you. Right? The Son in the New Testament is the one through whom all God's dealings with this creation are funneled. God creates the world through Christ, blesses the world through Christ, judges the world through Christ, saves the world through Christ, etc. This is why there's no way to the Father but through Christ because he is the point of contact for the Godhead to this world. The result, though, is that Christ comes in incarnational form. He shows us the relational, brotherly, approachable side of God. Not that the Father is unapproachable, but Christ specializes in that side. And the Holy Spirit is the one we have the least amount of data about because, as Jesus said, he doesn't like to talk about himself. (laughs) He likes to stay secret. So Christ had to do a little talking about him. And he seems to showcase that mysterious, incomprehensible, hiddenness, etc. of God. And one reason I believe we need this triune Godhead is, and especially the Adventist version, it forces us to grapple with all the elements of who God is in a balanced way. Your high churches like Catholicism tend to focus on the shock and awe, the Father. And Christ is so close to the Father that he's so high and mighty that we need Mary to go between us and him. The Protestants focus on Jesus as our friend and brother to the point in Adventist too that we forget about the high and reverential side. And the Pentecostals can get so emotional and mysterious that they lose grounding with basic scriptural reality. And so having to grapple with all three pushes us to a more well-rounded, balanced view of God so that we're unable to gravitate toward any one of the three persons and get out of balance. And I think that's a very important point for our Christian experience. Now, going to this interchangeability, look at this quote from Ellen White. Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling his glory and humbling himself that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding its record of his own condescending grace. In other words, the Father could have incarnated instead of the one we know as Son just as easily, and it wouldn't change the story. It's an amazing statement. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. But language seems to be so feeble. I refrain and with John exclaim. I refrain, two great words for us, right? And with John exclaim, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. She was, this is the last phrases of a letter she wrote to somebody. I forget to whom. It may have been her son. Now, I'm going to take 30 extra seconds. Look at the yellow highlight. If you take this out of the larger context of Ellen White, do you see how somebody could say Ellen White was modalist? Father and son are the same person, just different expressions. Okay. But I think both the context of this paragraph and even more so, 
the context of her larger theology, there's no way you can rightfully take that yellow phrase and make it modalism. She is talking about two persons here. But this is just to illustrate how easy it is to grab an isolated statement and leverage it toward your personal ideas without ignoring and ignoring the rest of the context. I refrain with John and exclaim, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not. So, very quick summary. I think there's a difference between creedal trinity with all of this begetting and philosophy versus a basic revelation that there are three persons that we know as God and we don't know how to explain it. Big areas of difference, they get into the eternal begetting of the Son. Our fundamental beliefs don't address that because it's not in the Bible, the eternal proceeding. And I believe the pioneers were rejecting these philosophical elements in which I will say more later. The areas of agreement, there are three beings, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are all deity, but there's only one God. We're all in agreement on that with the creedal Trinitarians. We just don't go into the details that way. So I've already did this, <clears throat> um, but I'll just say two more sentences. Beyond the well-balanced view of God, the Trinity should teach us that God is not knowable through human reason and philosophy. He must self-reveal and divine himself. And I think we need to be careful of theologies that try to over-define God, even if they claim to be Trinitarian. God needs to self-define and self-reveal. And this is crucial. It's a parallel function to the second commandment because the moment we think we've got God figured out, we've put him in a box and it's a God of our creation and we now bow down and worship an intellectual idol. Idolatry is alive and well, folks. We just carve our idols out of ideas instead of out of wood and stone. And the second commandment reminds us that God has a right to mystery and we need to honor that mystery. And throughout the ages, humans have tried to demystify God instead of live with that mystery. We know God through his roles and how he relates to us. We do not know his full being. Our primary knowledge is economic, not imminent. And I'll close <clears throat> with what I call the bedroom analogy. A five-year-old child develops a theory of marriage by watching mommy and daddy in the kitchen, in the living room, in the car, at the park, and so forth, right, at church. Then mommy and daddy put child to bed for the night and they go into their bedroom and they shut a door. And five-year-old has no clue about marriage in the bedroom. Right? Now, through certain accidents, he may develop partial theories, but he don't have a clue. Doesn't have a clue. We know God in the kitchen and in the church and in life but the privacy of God's bedroom is off limits and we need to let that privacy stay private and not speculate about God's relationship with himself in the bedroom. Our focus is on how God relates to us so that we can relate to him. And we're like the five-year-old. Let's recognize our limits and not even try to really imagine the bedroom but to imagine the oneness that God has talked about. Jesus talked about the oneness he had with the Father before he incarnated. That's something that's been revealed to us. We'll take that oneness and run with it. But let's be very, very careful when we speculate about the bedroom. 
In fact, we ought not to speculate. We pretty much leave that alone unless God says something about it. And let's focus on how he relates to us and how he wants us to relate to him. That's the key message of the Trinity. Let's pray to close this out. Thank you, Lord, for being with us. Please open our hearts and minds. We thank you that you so love us that you have revealed yourself to us in a way that we can understand relationally to relate back to you in a salvific way. Thank you for your great love to reach out to us. In the name of our mediator and your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, let God's people say. Now, just a quick word to our climate control people. Um, at least up here on the platform, I'm beginning to think it does burn forever. Uh, <laughs> so I don't know if there's a way we can get a little bit of help up here or not. But uh, uh, at the end of this day, if it doesn't change, I'm going to revise my eschatology here, I think. So.